Uh, tonight, we're going to take a deep dive into the complex social world of, of the honeybee and, uh, and use that to be able to talk about some principles that relate to the relationship between genes and social behavior that extend beyond the hive um, that are of a more general nature. I, before I begin, I just want to thank the Simons Foundation for this invitation. Uh, David and uh, Alyssa, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. And I also, also want to give a shout out to Perry for all the great arranging that was done for this visit. I had a wonderful time here, and everything was taken care of perfectly. So um, we're going to talk then about uh, the pillars of the social brain. And let me motivate that by uh, giving you a glimpse at some of the highlights, uh, for better or for worse, uh, fruits of the social brain, agriculture, construction, language, manufacture, I said for better or for worse, warfare, all of these as fruits of the social brain. And then, of course, the last one, governance, really underlying um, most of those uh, abilities forms of social organization that make, this, uh, po that make these traits possible. Now, when we're talking about discovering mechanisms of the social brain, uh, it leads to some questions that I think many of us are familiar with already. And of course, the Simons Foundation is, is dedicating itself to understanding these. How does social information, quote, get under the skin? That is, how does environmental information get into effect biology? How does social information interact with brain systems, reward system, learning, and memory, and so on and so forth, to actually be processed, integrated into the complex processes? How are socially re relevant decisions made? And of course, how do individuals coordinate their activities with each other to be able to make possible advanced social life? It's also possible to look at the social brain, the endeavors that, that we mount to be able to understand the social brain, and be mindful of the broader impacts. Of course, understanding the social brain helps us understand brains in general. It contributes to our understanding of health and wellness. It perhaps can help us predict both pre-social and anti-social behavior. And uh, as information, especially tonight, uh, will allow us to be able to make and communicate the genomic case against genetic determinism. So I'll be talking a little bit about that at the end of the talk, but I want to plant that seed for you uh, now. So when we think about the mechanisms of the social brain, um, it's quite obvious that one can address questions at different levels of biological organization, going from DNA all the way up to behavior um, with many levels of organization um, within the brain. Tonight, we'll be focusing especially on the level of gene expression, gene regulation, and so in the general parlance of biology, RNA. A little bit about DNA and a few words in comparison about some of these higher levels, but that's the focus of the experimental work that I'll be discussing tonight. Now, I'll be talking about it not uh, from the point of view of humans, but of course from the point of view of honeybees. Um, and uh, uh, as, as you heard Alyssa say, I do believe that uh, honeybees and other social insects uh, can be exemplars for this because I put the same traits up there for you and to say that uh, humans do not have a franchise on them. Now, yes, if you're paying attention, you will see I had to put together a few species uh, to be able to make the same point, so I'll give you that. But hopefully you'll give me the fact that we're talking about brains that have a million or fewer neurons, some the size of grass seeds or smaller, and still, still producing these kinds of complex traits, uh, positioning them well to be uh, exemplars and models for these studies. I'll also say that our model genetic systems, um, fruit flies, mice, C. elegans, have more modest social lives than the social insects, and so making it imperative that we do choose uh, models that have the kind of level of, of sociality that we aspire to understand. As I've said, uh, we'll be focusing on honeybees. So I want to give you just a quick introduction to some of the key features um, that commend honeybees for these studies. 
Uh, first of all, uh, bees are large enough that we can study them as individuals. We use uh, barcodes uh, for that, as the picture on, the, on your left uh, indicates. So we can do automated monitoring of individually identifiable bees. It's also possible to manipulate the social behavior of honeybees. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of centuries, thousands and thousands of years, actually, of beekeepers who have observed honeybees. Why? Because honeybees have produced the first sweetener known to humankind, and if that isn't enough, the first alcoholic beverage that was produced. And so as a result, people have been very interested in watching honeybees and trying to get them to do what they want done. And so that gives us a lot of information as bee scientists were able to, to use. Secondly, division of labor, a hallmark of all advanced societies, uh, creates extreme behavioral states. So this little uh, picture that you see right up on the top right depicts fancifully uh, a bee working in the hive and then a bee foraging. So that's the basic division of labor between the workers in these insect societies. And it basically goes like this in honeybees. Honey, adult honeybees live about six weeks. They spend the first two to three weeks working in the hive. Then they grad at a, a series of jobs. And then they graduate and become foragers. They're either doing foraging activities or they're defending the hive for the rest of their life. Those states are expanded. They're extreme. They're not just a few minutes of fleeting uh, activity that they go on to the next. This allows us, especially if we're working at the RNA level, this allows us to be able to have a fix on a particular behavioral state and measure gene expression associated with it. Why do I belabor this point? Changes in gene expression are slow relative to changes at uh, higher levels of brain organization, circuit levels, neurophysiology, and so forth, point I will be coming back to later. And so having these extreme behavioral states uh, gives us uh, a bigger target, if, if you will. Social environment, number three, the social environment can be precisely controlled. The picture that you see on the right, for those of you who have never had the pleasure of seeing these before, those tall white boxes, each stack is a beehive. It's a family. It's composed of between 40 to 60,000 individuals. In the case of honeybees, a single queen. All the individuals there are part of the same family. They work in an integrated way. And so we are then able uh, to make manipulations and do social engineering on a, on a grand scale. F uh, fourth, neurobiological and genomic resources are uh, available, becoming more and more available. They're not as advanced as in the uh, model genetic systems that I mentioned before, but they're coming on board. And the uh, laboratory of Daniel Cronauer is really leading the way in the development of genomic, functional genomic resources at, at Rockefeller University uh, to manipulate uh, the kinds of hypotheses that are generated with descriptive uh, discovery genomics. But the resources are coming available more and more species. And then finally, just kind of a statement about complex social life, genetics influences behavioral predispositions, and then social interactions uh, influence the adaptability, the flexibility that one sees. That's a truism of any society. We could say that for humans. We can say that for ants. We can say that for for bees. So um, another introductory point that I want to make is that uh, another reason for working at the level that we're working at is that comparative genomics is easier than comparative neurobiology. With genomics, we have a tool that can be summarized as a statistical test of the similarity of sequences. For those of you cognizanting the audience, you know I'm talking about BLAST. We can ask whether the sequence in one species, however distantly related it is from another species, we can ask if those sequences are so similar that we can call them cousins or orthologs. That is a huge amount of insight that that gives us. By contrast, in the more traditional areas of neuroscience, we don't even know how many times brains have evolved. There are interesting theories on multiple evolutions, single evolution, and so forth. 
making it very difficult to do comparative neurobiology across the spans of evolution that we need to be able to derive general principles. So tonight we'll be talking about three genomic pillars of the social brain, the three C's, close relationship, a causal relationship, and an evolutionarily conserved relationship. For each case, I'll summarize some results from one to two to three studies to give you a feel uh, for that, enough data, hopefully, that you can sink your teeth in, but not so much that I won't be able to finish all three Cs. So on to the first one, a close relationship. This is really what started it all um, for the field of behavioral genomics, this discovery uh, that we made in my lab about 20 years ago that brain gene expression and, uh, and behavioral states are closely related. And I'll talk about that from the point of view of socially regulated behavioral maturation and then extend that to a more recent study uh, talking about changes from cooperation to selfishness um, in another behavioral context in honeybees. Socially regulated behavioral maturation is another way of talking about the division of labor system. That's that picture on the lower left. Um, so I mentioned the basic division of labor. What I didn't mention yet, and I'm about to right now, is that there's great flexibility. So yes, the bees spend the first two and a half to three weeks working in the high foraging, unless there's a need to speed up their maturation. Suppose the foraging force is lost um, due to uh, predators or a sudden storm catching all the foragers outside, or in more modern terms, pesticides. Younger bees are able to speed up their rate of behavioral maturation, become precocious foragers. Bees can actually speed up, slow down, and stay as overage nurses, kind of like Peter Pan, never grow up, or even reverse their maturation from foraging back to working in the hive based on the needs of the colony. We exploited that to be able to look at uh, and ask the very first question about relationship between gene expression and behavior. Then the second behavioral context um, shows that really sinister looking bee there. Um, what happened here is a honeybee colony is mostly sweetness and light, mostly living harmoniously. But if the queen is lost and the worker bees are not able to rear a replacement queen from the babies in the hive, the, long, the young larvae, then what happens is some of them develop ovaries. And they, they have rudimentary ovaries, but they're usually inhibited by the queen and the other aspects of the social structure. Once they develop ovaries, some of them change their approach to life, and they now engage in much less cooperative behavior and more selfish behavior, um, laying eggs. So we exploited that um, in a way that I'll show you in a moment. But first, the first one. So these were the first two studies. Um, just for you who are historically oriented, the first uh, um, general technology for measuring the expression of many genes at the same time, called the microarray, was developed in Pat Brown's lab, Joe DeRisi's PhD. Um, it was published in 1997. Um, we developed uh, the ability to use that approach to be able to ask the question um, that we're talking about now. Individual, a few individual genes had been found to be socially regulated, but we had no idea the scale of, of that. And um, so we did this experiment um, to compare nurses and foragers and to uncouple age from behavior in the ways that I just mentioned before, looking at overage nurses, looking at precocious foragers. And we were just shocked to see that 40% of the genes in the brain uh, show differential expression in the nurse state versus the forager state. This is just simply a heat map showing genes downregulated or upregulated. I just am giving you the pattern. Don't look for any um, hidden meaning in specific genes. So that was work that was led by former postdoc Charlie Whitfield, who was on the faculty in the, at the University of Illinois and retired just a couple years ago. Um, he took early retirement. I'm not that old. Maybe I am. But anyways, well, that's another story. Second study done by former postdoc Christina Grosinger, um, who's now on the faculty at Penn State, uh, took advantage of one of these social factors that regulates how fast bees grow up, queen pheromone. Queen pheromone delays behavioral maturation. 
and uh, cr uh, Christina found that it behaves exactly as we would expect if there is this close relationship. That is, it, for genes that are upregulated in foragers, the QMP, queen mandibular pheromone, downregulates them. And for genes that are upregulated in nurses, in the brains of nurses, QMP upregulates that. So giving us um, a feeling that there's this uh, close relationship. Secondly, um, the selfish and altruistic behavior study. Uh, this is the work of Burrell Jones, who just finished a postdoc at uh, Princeton and now is starting her lab at the University of Kentucky. So um, the, uh, the, what happened here was uh, in order to sample the bees that were altruistic, that is those that continue to work for the hive and those that switch to selfishness, uh, she used, Burrell used our barcode system and we got a lot of data, and that allowed us to see this really interesting group that I highlighted for you called both. So most bees specialized. They were altruistic, continued to forage, to continue to defend the nest. Their ovaries were inhibited, and they continued to work for the good of the hive. Other bees had developed ovaries, activated ovaries, and they stopped doing those jobs and started mostly egg laying. But a small group of bees uh, did both. And so we took advantage of that to see how far we could push this close relationship. And uh, Burrell's data are really quite interesting in that regard. So push, I mean gene expression, but then also extend to gene regulation. So on the top, you can see, uh, and these are now uh, processed data um, showing uh, pr principal component analysis that give you the general trends, you can see that uh, on the x-axis, we have the specialist score. Uh, were they extreme altruists or extremely special, uh, selfish? And then on the y-axis, a measure of gene expression. And you can see that the two groups um, cluster very nicely, uh, very separately from each other. But um, the group that, of bees that do both, you can see that they're intermediate between uh, both. The rest of the details, different colonies, um, and uh, to be able to, to replicate, I should have said at the beginning that we always will aim to do a study with more than one colony, even if we have large sample sizes of workers, because a colony is a unit, uh, it's an integrated unit. It's not just an aggregation of individuals. It actually is the unit upon which natural selection acts, upon which evolution acts to shape the traits of social insects. So every colony is different, and studying something in one colony doesn't give you a full picture. So that's, that's, that's what you see. So um, what I'm trying to say is that bees that are intermediate in their behavior also are intermediate in their gene expression. And then that extends also to gene regulation using a, me a method called a tax seek, for those of you that know it, that just measures the openness of the stretch of DNA known as chromatin that allows transcription factors to bind to be able to orchestrate gene expression, that that measure also shows the same thing, that differences in chromatin accessibility with respect to the two extreme groups, but then intermediate levels um, as well. And uh, I, I also wanted to make the point that while we're focusing tonight largely on patterns um, to be able to, to share with you ideas on pillars, uh, also we do this work to try to get ideas about specific genes that can be followed up. And uh, we have identified a set of transcription factors that I'll mostly just be mentioning in passing that keep coming up repeatedly in studies. And uh, we have some causal information uh, about them, and they seem to be of particular importance in orchestrating gene regulatory networks associated with sociality. So in closing this first part of the talk, I want to emphasize that uh, this close relationship is surprisingly close. And that's, again, going back to this schematic, neuroplasticity. There are levels of neuroplasticity that are more proximal to behavior. Who knew that when you go further away, you will see this close relationship? 
the model that we worked under before behavioral animal behavioral genomics started was a model that came to us from the field of learning and memory, where, um, of course, changes in gene expression were, were well established, but they were mostly on the order of producing parts for the factory. Um, having, making sure the raw materials were there, episodic changes uh, to, associated with, with learning and memory, um, not necessarily predicting this close relationship with the behavior itself. So this is all the fruits of, of these last 20 years related to animal behavioral genomics. Studying naturally occurring behaviors and behaviors that are either instinctive or some combination of instinct and learning. Okay, so we have a close relationship. What good is it? What, what's the use for it? I want to now show you some evidence that shows that there are causal relationships between changes in gene expression and behavior. And to do this, I want to focus on some brain uh, GRN, or gene regulatory network analyses, revealing causal transcription factors that I just mentioned before, and some aggression-related neurometabolism. Before going on, I just want to say quickly a word about GRNs. I'll use that abbreviation, Gene Regulatory Network, GRNs. Um, and that is simply a model of the relationship between gene expression, gene, the expression of different genes, with one particular key point, and that is not all genes are created equally. There are some genes whose job it is is to regulate the expression of other genes. These are known as transcription factors. So the way you build a gene regulatory network is you survey a number of behavioral states. The more, the better. You have uh, measures of gene expression as a function of context, and you ask the algorithm to match the expression of a transcription factor uh, to a set of genes uh, as closely as possible. Then you create modules, and then you build the network up uh, from there. So that's a gene regulatory network. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about um, a, the concept of gene regulatory network rewiring because what we found when we created the first brain gene regulatory network, drawing on a large data set, 48 different behavioral states, uh, 853 uh, individuals, those, three, those uh, 853 individuals uh, and 48 behavioral states fall into three buckets that you see here, foraging, maturation, and aggression. Uh, what we saw, first of all, were some master regulators. No surprise, the model selects for that, essentially, looking for those that are at the top of a regulatory hierarchy. It was nice to see. They're interesting, and so on and so forth. But the really surprising thing was this context dependence, which is that the relationship of genes to each other depends on the behavioral state. It depends on the brain that you're measuring it from. So the GRN of a forager is different than the GRN of an aggressive soldier bee. And I can show this to you here. Hopefully, it's clear here. We have the three buckets, blue, red, and green. And all I want you to see, if you look at the expression of a transcription factor known as broad and one of its predicted target genes, and these predictions are based, by the way, on biochemically characterized work from Drosophila that we draw upon, you can see that the shape of the curves are different that all three are different shapes, meaning the relationship between the expression of the TF, the transcription factor, and its target gene is a function of the context, the behavioral context. So mining those data gave us two very interesting transcription factors to ask whether this interesting context dependence has any causal significance. One is broad, abbreviated here as BR, and the other one is FTZF1. We chose those two because broad regulates FTZF1, known from the Drosophila literature, so determined genetically. But in addition to that, our model predicted that uh, broad would regulate FTZF1, but that there would be effects of both transcription factors on behavioral maturation, measured as the age at onset of foraging, but only broad was predicted 
to regulate aggression, to influence the expression of aggression, FTZ not. And so uh, we tested those predictions with uh, brain injections of RNAi, and they were upheld. This is the work of former graduate student Adam Hamilton. And what you can see on the top, uh, a measure of age at onset of foraging, uh, the cumulative proportion of bees foraging, and on the x-axis, the age. And you can see that the two RNAi groups uh, showed an effect of age at onset of foraging of the RNAi manipulation. You'll note that it's an earlier onset of foraging. That's important because essentially this is uh, the equivalent uh, in genetic terms of a gain of function. And that's important because injecting RNAi into an adult brain is not as precise a method as genome editing a single gene and turning it on a specific point in time. And so we have here a situation, so prone to side effects, prone to artifacts, and so forth. But here we are causing an earlier onset of foraging, a gain of function. We're causing bees to go out and start the riskiest and most cognitively challenging uh, phase of their life, where they have to learn landmarks, they have to learn the, uh, the direction that the sun travels, they have to integrate that information for their famous dance language, more about that later, and all of that. So if these injections are causing that, it's less likely that we are tapping into some artifact. So uh, that was just a quick aside. Um, back to the main point, uh, broad did affect aggression. This is a, a dish bee assay uh, that's based on the nestmate recognition of honeybees and other social insects. They can distinguish relatives from foreign bees, even in an artificial lab context, and will show aggression towards uh, an intruder. And when we knock down uh, broad expression, it affects aggression. Uh, they, they, you see a decrease in aggression in this case, um, but FTZF1 has no effect. So evidence for a causal relationship predicted by gene expression via a GRN. Another case, more recent case, of um, work related to GRNs predicting causal relationship. This time it's more of a genetic type prediction. So we took advantage of a discovery in Puerto Rico uh, by former student Tura Garay, uh, who's now on the faculty at the University of Puerto Rico, who found gentle Africanized bees. So as you know, Africanized bees spread through the Western Hemisphere, uh, much more aggressive uh, than uh, the European-derived subspecies of honeybees. But uh, when they arrived in Puerto Rico, about 10 years later, uh, it turns out that they have become gentle. So I, I'm just summarizing very quickly for you uh, the background work that we did. We did a population genomic study, uh, showed that it was a soft sweep. Anyone interested in hearing more about that, happy to talk later. Uh, we did a behavioral genetics uh, study, a, a GWAS study, to find single nucleotide polymorphism, SNPs, uh, associated with differences in aggression. Interestingly, found them for the colony phenotype rather than the individual phenotype. And then um, a study that I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about, um, we found uh, some evidence that when we look at the regulatory genomics, look at gene regulatory networks at the single cell level, we are able to go from genotype to phenotype. That is, we are able to ask the question, how do some of those SNPs that are associated with the loss of aggression, what do they do in the bee? So just to recapitulate, this was the GWAS. We found a set of SNPs um, that were not only associated with the differences in colony aggression, but also under selection from our population genomic study that formed the set of alleles that were our targets to ask, okay, what might some of them be doing? And so we did transcriptomics, single cell transcriptomics, and tried to marry them. And the level at which that marriage occurred was at the single cell GRN level. This is, by the way, the work of Ian Triniello, a former uh, graduate student in the lab who's now doing a postdoc at Princeton. Uh, a key algorithm was developed in the lab of Mikhail Hernaz, uh, who formerly was at the University of Illinois in the IGB, in the Woes Institute, and now has his own lab um, in an institute in Spain. Um, and this is a very complex slide. Basically, this shows uh, clusters of cells and the regulatory dissimilarity for each cluster between two groups of focal bees. The aggressive bees, soldiers, 
and bees that are not aggressive, foragers. Give you a flavor for these behavioral states. The way we identify soldiers is we wave uh, leather flags at the entrance of a colony after scientifically kicking the colony. And then we get the first bees that come out. They are the soldiers. And so we're able to capture them. Meanwhile, while that disturbance is going on, there are other bees in the colony that are completely ignoring that and going in and out foraging. So these are the foraging extremes. There clearly is trafficking between those two states. Don't get me wrong. They're not physical casts where this is what they do uh, throughout their life. But we can capture those extremes, the first ones that respond to the leather patch and the ones that are continuing to forage. And the take-home message is seen uh, right here on the left, excuse me, on the right. And what it says is that when you look at the regulatory dissimilarity, you see higher levels of dissimilarity in the topology of the gene regulatory networks as a function of the level of aggression. The greater the colony aggression, the more difference between soldiers and foragers. And those differences are associated with some of the SNPs that we found in our behavior genetic study, in our genome-wide association study. They hit some things that are very exciting to us, um, particular subpopulations of, uh, of cells in the bee brain that uh, already we had shown, Ian's work earlier, shown using immediate early genes, are responsive to social challenge, the so-called class one Kenyan cells. And they also implicate serotonin which already has been shown mechanistically to be involved in aggression, but this is the first time it's that the path leading to it is a genetic path with SNPs and some of the genes associated with it. So um, for the purposes of what we're talking about now, the take-home message is a causal relationship um, between gene expression and behavior. I will say also, with the, in the context of comments at the very end of the talk, that these results that show that the colony environment influences the topology of gene regulatory networks, when you extrapolate that, it basically says that GWAS studies depend on the environment. And think about that when we think about studies in human behavior genetics, for example, associated with educational attainment, the implications of this uh, assertion here. And then finally, the last part of the causal piece of the talk is a more traditional sort of approach. So in our studies on social challenge, led by Haggai Spiegler, former postdoc in the lab, now has his own lab in Israel, um, we found evidence that there are changes in gene expression that implicate changes in metabolism. In particular, a decrease in the genes associated with oxidative phosphorylation and an increase in the genes associated with aerobic glycolysis. Uh, we uh, tested those results, uh, extending them to the proteomic level, looking at changes in enzyme activity, focusing on the particular pathways in um, the, the uh, energy production systems, electron transfer systems, and so forth, uh, to be able to do that. So that's part of a larger model that I won't be talking about right now. But um, the key part that we're talking about is that changes in mitochondrial function associated with both mitochondrially encoded and nuclear encoded genes that gave us this picture. So we tested that functionally in traditional ways. In honeybees, we tested it pharmacologically. Here's a picture of the behavioral assay. Uh, this was the work of Claire Richoff, who, a former postdoc who uh, is on the faculty at University of Kentucky. And uh, she used specific inhibitors, uh, complex one, complex five, which is what the gene expression data told us the action was at, and was able to show that by pharmacologically treating bees uh, with these inhibitors, uh, OxFos inhibitors, uh, she was able to increase aggression, another gain of function type thing. In Drosophila, work by former postdoc Hong Mei Lai Bari Lai, at, at now in her own lab at Ohio University, um, using genetic approaches to be able to manipulate the expression of a particular mitochondrial uh, gene uh, using the ELAV pro, uh, promoter, which expresses it, uh, the gene, the construct, only in neurons. Um, Hong Mei was able to see an increased aggression. And again, for you fly folks, those are the parental lines that we used as the controls. 
Um, the fruit fly result was, was particularly nice, and perhaps a little preview of the final part of the talk. Fruit flies use aggression, but for very different reasons than honeybees do. And so to see the same neurometabolic changes driving uh, increases in aggression um, in entirely different social context, behavioral context, um, gives us a sense that this change in OxFos um, has more generality. And indeed, we've also now seen it in collaborative work uh, with mice. So um, a final point about the causal relationships has to do with this time scale issue that I mentioned before. Changes in, in gene expression happen slowly. So think about social challenge. Uh, when there's a social challenge, an animal has to respond immediately. It can't wait for changes in gene expression. It's just too slow. So what's going on here? I'm asserting a causal relationship, um, but yet I'm telling you that that's uh, on a time scale that's not appropriate. So uh, the way Ian and I have been thinking about this um, in a, a review, an annual review of neuroscience, we talk about it in the context of neurons are for today, genes are for tomorrow. The idea being that neurons are tuned, neural circuits are tuned to a particular stimulus level. They're ready to go, they're ready to fire, they're ready to organize and activate behavior, and that happens. But in addition to that, something about those processes, the act of the behavior, the exposure to the stimulus, also triggers slower changes at the molecular level, changes in gene expression that now reconfigure the neuronal networks so that they are at a different state. In the case of threat, usually ecology predicts threat, one threat will lead to another threat. And so if you've been exposed to a threat and you respond like a, like a social challenge assay or the real thing, then you'll be more vigilant. That change is a molecular change. And in fact, uh, an experimental detail that I didn't share with you until now is when we measure changes in gene expression as a function of response to social challenge, we do it 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and 120 minutes after the stimulus has happened. We pick the bees that responded the most strongly. So we're looking at the after effects. We see beautiful waves, consistent waves of gene expression, nothing to do with that immediate response. We put it another way, PTSD, the stress never goes away. In honeybees, they are vigilant for a while, but then they'll calm down if there's no further stress. So when we think about it that way, it gives us the explanatory framework and the beginnings of a conceptual framework to be able to assert that what we need to do now in neuroscience is integrate neuronal networks and gene regulatory networks. And we now have the tools to do that because of the single cell revolution, to be able to take neuronal networks and then elucidate the gene regulatory networks inside those neurons and then develop a formalism to understand the integration of activity at the neuronal level and activity at the GRN level. I personally think this is a very important area. We have right now a situation where these two parts of neuroscience don't talk to each other as much as they should, certainly from a point of view of, of conceptual uh, integration. So this is a, a diagram here that just basically highlights the ways uh, just the GRNs and the neural networks, and as if that's not complicated enough, developmental um, GRNs, so how the brain is wired up also uh, can be modeled using GRNs. So it's very fortuitous that we have the technical resources and we have this network concept working really well in neuroscience, neuronal networks, working really well in behavioral genomics, the GRN, and working really well in developmental biology, um, developmental gene regulatory networks. So the stage is set for, I think, a really important uh, integration. OK, the third and final uh, C uh, pillar that we're going to talk about tonight is evolutionary conservation. It's a special pleasure to be able to talk about this work tonight here because the work was funded by the Simons Foundation and especially uh, Jerry Fishbach when he was active. So a shout out to Jerry. I know he couldn't be here tonight. He promised to watch the uh, recording of it. And uh, we really appreciate uh, the confidence that he showed us for an idea that at its time, about uh, 12 years ago, was really untested. 
And so what we're going to talk about then is the idea that similar social behaviors in distantly related species rely on common genetic toolkits. In some cases, derived, we can see sort of the derivation from solitary behaviors. And so I'll talk about, first about that uh, me to we uh, kind of thing in the context of dance communication. And then more generally, genetic toolkits across a broader span of evolution talking about social responsiveness. So um, for dance communication, uh, let me motivate this by saying that when flies find good food, they eat more. When honeybees find good food, that is a good, rich nectar source out in the environment, they don't eat more. They come back to the hive and they dance more. They use a communication system that uh, uh, allows them to communicate distance, direction, and quality. For those of you that have never had the pleasure of seeing it in action, this is what it looks like. Um, these movements uh, provide this kind of information, symbolic information. Uh, as far as we know, honeybees are the only species with what some argue is a symbolic language to be able to communicate uh, this information. So we picked up on that statement that I said before about flies and bees, picked up on that and studied uh, this the system. So first I want to show you some neuroanatomy data and some gene expression data. Um, and what we did in this study was we compared me bees to we bees. We compared bees that are foraging at a artificial feeding station uh, with really high quality food, enough uh, so that they are going to go home and go back to the hive and dance about it. Tell their others, like writing a Yelp about a great restaurant. And bees in the lab who are starved and then given a droplet of food, um, and all they want to do was ingest that food. They're out of context, they're starved, and so we did that. We did a transcriptomic study of one particular part of the brain, the mushroom bodies. For those of you that study insects, know it's an order, uh, it, it's, a, it's a region uh, involved in sensory integration, learning and memory, and our studies have shown uh, social, uh, social responsiveness as well. And so massive changes in gene expression, which are the red circles, just to give you a summary diagram, massive changes in gene expression as a result of ingesting um, food, those red circles. The blue circles are the bees that came home to the hive and danced, and then we captured them after they showed us that they were dancing. And you can see that those genes are a subset. The we genes are a subset of the me genes. Likewise, using immediate, immediate early gene activation, the diagram on the right, and I just realized this part of the audience must hate me for always looking over here rather than over here, so I'll try not to do that anymore. Um, so what you see for, uh, for the diagram on the right is that um, massive changes in activity across many different subparts of the brain, and again, um, the blue areas show just a, a few areas that are activated as a function of dance, and they all are subsets uh, within the other part. So we have this large me that's then co-opted, uh, at least mechanistically, we can't say evolutionarily um, from this picture here, um, but as a subset of the selfish response. Going a little deeper into this, um, when flies find good food, they eat more. It turns out that one neurochemical known as octopamine, chemically very similar to dopamine, uh, when you treat flies with octopamine, it makes flies eat more. What former postdoc Andy Barron showed with honeybees um, is that, uh, and Andy has a lab in Macquarie University in uh, Sydney, Australia, when you treat bees with octopamine, it, make, it makes them dance more. In this case, the, the technique was to give them a food source that was so-so, eh, not enough to cause a massive change uh, in dance activity, but just kind of borderline. And that gave us headroom to be able to see a possible octopamine result, and in fact we did. And he showed that bees are three times more likely to dance when treated octopamine. This is the experimental setup. Um, for those of you that are concerned about side effects with respect to biogenic amines affecting motor control, dance is, after all, a motor activity. That's why we did all of this. You can train bees to go through this tunnel, and bees measure distance via optic flow. 
how much visual information goes by. This is beautiful, elegant work by Manya and Srinivasan, University of Queensland. And the, the proof of the pudding was to change the walls of the tunnel. And then you could show that if bees fly through a dense checkerboard pattern like this, even though it's a relatively short distance in one of our enclosed flight enclosures, they get to the end of that and they go, wow, that was really a long distance. And they show you that by means of the dance. Whereas same bees, same distance, changing the checkerboard pattern to be very sparse, they get to the end of that and say, ah, piece of cake, just a short distance. And so we can use the dances to indicate that the, there was no difference in, in perception of dance and the quality of the dance and so forth. That is no side effects of the octopamine or the cocaine. And it's a, it's a real concern because these biogenic amines do affect so many different aspects of neuroscience, of neurobiology. So, um, so that's the main point. Um, but there's also that little thing about cocaine there. You're wondering why we have that. Um, so uh, cocaine, biochemically, is characterized as an octopamine reuptake inhibitor. It exists in nature as an insecticide. So if you understand that, using cocaine is a trivial add-on. Why, why bother? The reason why we bothered is because we want to argue that this shows that the reward system of the insect brain, of the honeybee brain, has been co-opted to be able to give the bee pleasure when it's doing a group activity. That's a big leap especially in the context of the fact that the reward system in any insect, including Drosophila, is nowhere near as elucid, well elucidated as uh, the vertebrate reward system. So we thought we'll take a baby step in that direction and ask whether cocaine, biochemically predicted to have this effect, does have the effect. Because as we all know in biology, stranger things have happened. So we did that, and we were pleased uh, to see that. And moreover, that the octopamine blocker also blocks the cocaine effect. So we see um, some me to we kinds of social evolutionary sorts of things, conserve mechanisms that moved in that direction. And then um, the last uh, experimental work is to talk about uh, the work that was funded by the Simons Foundation and that asked the question, are behaviors that look similar on the outside built from similar components on the inside? This is the team that my lab is privileged to work with at the uh, Institute. Um, we have uh, Allison Bell, neurogenomics of stickleback fish, Julian Katchen, uh, bioinformatician, Hisan Han, uh, who's developing spatial uh, transcriptomics methods, uh, Saurabh Sinha, computational genomicist, Lisa Stubbs, who is a um, mouse neurogeneticist, and uh, Dave Zhao, a statistical genomicist. We worked with the three species. We looked at social challenge, social opportunity. We published a, a nice um, set of papers saying that the answer to the question uh, here is yes. In the course of those experiments, Hagai Spiegler uh, noticed that some bees are non-responders. So the experiments were done for social challenge, for social opportunity, um, and done in two separate years. And in, in all of those experiments, there were some bees that didn't respond. So uh, Hagai repeated those studies, this time giving them both choices at the same time, giving them the opportunity to be assayed repeatedly. In other words, the first observations were anecdotal for this question, the social non-responsiveness. So we went back and studied uh, and set up a study specifically for this and found, indeed, that non-responders are a thing. Here's the ethogram that you see uh, on the uh, middle figure right here. The green ones are the unresponsive bees. Um, and, and they exist. Between 10 and 18% of the bees are socially uh, um, non-responding to these two stimuli. Uh, the panel on the right shows a principal component analysis of brain transcriptomics that basically makes the point that unresponsive bees are a thing. That is, they cluster separately from the bees that respond preferentially to the social challenge, social, so-called so guards, and those that respond preferentially to the social opportunity, nurse bees. I didn't mention what the social opportunity assay is. It is to give a queen larva. And since workers generally don't reproduce themselves, to have the opportunity to rear a sister as a queen is as good as it gets under normal uh, conditions. So armed with that information, we now had a set of genes 
that were distinguishing, characterizing the socially unresponsive bees. And we asked whether there's statistical overlap with genes that have been implicated in autism. The large data set came from the Simons Foundation, the Safari GSM database. And then there was a second data set coming from post-mortem gene expression. So the first database was DNA, and the second one was RNA. But they both uh, implicate genes. Um, what you see is that the yellow rows highlight statistically significant overlap with the socially unresponsive genes from honeybees. We were pleased, especially with the uh, Safari data set, to see that the tier one, tier two, and three genes, and I imagine we have some experts from the Simons Foundation from this project right here in the audience, so we could talk about this further, but that the higher confidence genes were the ones that showed uh, the overlap. Uh, some of the key categories were related to synapse function. Some syntaxins, some neuroligins um, were, were implicated. Ian Trignello has uh, continued this work as the last part of his postdoc, of his graduate uh, uh, work before he moved on uh, to his postdoc. Uh, we did a GWAS, genome wide association study, um, using a change in the behavioral assay, um, and this time again taking advantage of the um, high throughput behavioral system. We switched from the lab assay of those two stimuli to an assay involving touching and exchanging fluids with another member of the colony. This is known as trophallaxis. It's sort of the social glue in many insect societies, the equivalent of grooming in primates. And uh, first, we were pleased to see that uh, bees that are classified as non-responders in the uh, lab assay were actually also on the fringe of the social network. You have just a typical uh, hairball uh, figure there showing um, this. And the non-responders, the black circles, were those that were least connected. So some nice congruence. That then allowed us to, and that was, that's a quantitative behavior uh, rather than um, the qualitative one from the lab assay. That allowed us to do a GWAS, implicating neuroligin 2 as a key um, gene, that uh, candidate gene involved in this. And uh, just a couple of tidbits that I want to highlight. Um, uh, some of the uh, results really hint at, at genotype by environment interactions. If you look at R2, the uh, genotype that's displayed both, and you look at the x-axis, the level of sociability, you can see that R2's performance depends on who it's coupled with. R stands for a different genotype, a set of Bs that have queen mom and a single father, um, so genetically more homogeneous uh, group. And you can see that the uh, sociability of the R2 genotype depends on what other genotype it was coupled with. An example, by the way, of the kind of social engineering that we can do with, uh, with honeybees. OK, in wrapping up, um, let me hearken back to the, uh, to the social unresponsiveness results and the implication that there's a connection there to autism. Let me be very clear. We're not saying that bees are little humans or humans are big bees. Autism is a very complex um, phenomenon, uh, condition. It's associated with a variety of phenotypes, not trying to be glib at all about this. Um, what instead we're saying, and genomics gives us the ability to do this, is looking at building blocks of behavior. So from the evolutionary perspective, it's, uh, I think, a relatively simple point to make. The last common ancestor of the lineages leading to social insects and the lineages leading to ourselves um, is thought to be a marine flatworm living some 600 million years ago and uh, um, a very rudimentary nervous system, no brain to speak of, no known social life. And yet, here we see these uh, results in bees and humans. What do we make of that? Um, one assertion that we can make is that these were independently evolved uh, societies and that nature has used and reused the same building blocks repeatedly in different contexts. 
This gets us away from having to talk at the level of the behavior of how similar it is, how different it is. And for those of you that remember, this was the debate that occurred as a result of E.O. Wilson's 1975 sociobiology, which in fairness, there were no tools to be able to do anything other than compare at the behavioral level. We now have those tools. They're fueled by this very similar, simple algorithm called BLAST to be able to talk about same genes in different contexts. And finally, let's be careful. Here's the genomic case against genetic determinism, and this is a summary of the talk. There are common genetic toolkits for social behavior in animals and humans, giving us license to talk about this in this way. Genes that influencing behavior operate within gene regulatory networks that respond flexibly, contextually, stochastically, rather than deterministically. The molecular wiring of the brain is altered by the environment and heredity. Social environments affect genotypes differently, classic G by E interactions. And the implication of some of the work is that the impact of specific DNA variants would be more pronounced in some environments than the others. So with this information, I think we can assert the point that I make at the bottom, which is in the 20th century, we knew that genetic determinism and eugenics that it spawned uh, were both morally and ethically wrong. But now in the 21st century, we also know as a result of nearly 25 years of animal behavior genomics that it's scientifically wrong. And so I think uh, those of us in the field have a responsibility to be engaging uh, on this very important uh, issue in our society. So looking back then, this was made possible by the discovery of social regulation of brain, brain gene expression over 20 years ago, which kind of opened the door. Looking forward, I think it'd be important to elucidate principles of me to we genetic toolkits, why certain genes are used uh, in different contexts in this way. As I said, um, better integrate uh, or start to integrate neuronal networks and gene regulatory networks, better connect animal and human studies. They're largely siloed at this point with respect to uh, genetics. We need to go beyond traditional GWAS to be able to include the environment in human behavior genetics studies. And uh, we also need to develop new methods to understand uh, the social brain. And if you want to ask me about EMRI during the question period, I'd be happy to talk about it. So uh, I want to acknowledge uh, those folks whose work I talked about tonight. Hopefully, if I did my job, I mentioned all of them, um, collaborators, and then various funding sources. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Yes. So I have a couple of related questions, and it's about the first part of your talk about the close relationship between behavior and gene expression. And I may be coming at it too much from a learning and memory perspective, but those changes, the 40% changes, they look like development. And you have these behaviors that are going from being in the hive to foraging. So how do you think about them as different from a developmental change? And they also then makes me ask, the question of with those large magnitude changes, are there fewer, is there less diversity in cell types in the honeybee brain so you don't dilute it by having a lot of changes? And then the third is, again, learning memory, are there changes in connectivity in the brain that you see going from, you know, the hive state to the foraging mm -hmm. state? Yeah. So we don't know about changes in connectivity. Daniel Cronauer is working on a connectome in, in his ant species. And that'll be really uh, a game changer. We have looked at a cruder level uh, earlier, and that has to do with changes in volumes of particular subregions of the brain. And one sees striking changes associated with the different behavioral states, hinting at that finer level um, going on, but we don't know yet. Um, and uh, another way to, to paraphrase the second part of your, your second question is, how is it that you can see such big differences when in your first experiments you looked at the whole brain? How crude could that be? And the answer, that's true. And that's where I think the, um, by the way, we're at a finer scale now, just to make it clear. We're at the single cell level. But um, those early experiments were done that way. And I think that goes back to these extreme behavioral states. Um, they are marshalling the activity of different regions 
they're all marching on, this, on the same page. They're all focused on that. They're not involved in quick changes. That's a hand-waving suggestion. And then the first question is a really cool one, um, and, and it really goes to the issue of where does neural development you know, leave off and neuroplasticity start? Um, it's not clear. And um, you know, development went molecular before neuroscience did. And so if you look in uh, gene ontology, they're called developmental genes. But they, many of them have these other roles. And is it a developmental gene that has another role? Or is it just that that was given that name first? So it, it's, it's not clear uh, at all. Though operationally, we can separate age from behavior, which is a specific part of your question. Um, so foragers are older than nurses, 40% are different. How much of that is age versus behavior? By I went through this very fast, I'll say it again. By uncoupling age from behavior, we can do that with social manipulations. And we see, not all, but a lot of the same changes associated with the old forager versus young nurse, we also see in young forager, young nurse, or old forager, old nurse. And so it is associated with a particular behavioral state. Do those genes also have roles in neural development? I wouldn't be shocked at all. Like the neural ligand hit associated with social responsive, unresponsiveness, of course, that's, you know, it's known for synapse development. Yes? Uh, you mentioned the nurses and the foragers. Are there sex-specific differences between nurse, nurse, nurses and foragers? And if so, do you see this, or how do you incorporate the sex-specific differences when the social um, dynamics? We also know this um, is prevalent in human autism patients when there's a social so, um, dichotomy between um, males and females. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that one's my mistake. I didn't mention a key part of the insect societies, the ants and the bees and the wasps, and that is that the workers are all female. So the queen is female and the workers are female. There are males in most of these insect societies, but their only known function is to mate with the virgin queens. They don't, they're not involved in the social activities. So, sorry about that. Yes? Between the uh, neurotransmitter receptors, uh, serotonin or octamine? Um, in general, I can say that many of them have enough DNA level and predicted protein level uh, sequence similarity to allow us to talk about them in those ways, to say that this is the orthologue of that and so forth, and others not. So it's, it's a mixed bag. So in some cases, one can say this is clearly an orthologue, and in other cases, one can say it's in the family, but not clear. Because as you know, I think you know receptors diversify a lot. And so even within vertebrates, there isn't sometimes a simple way of looking at that. But in some cases, we can. Yeah. It, it is curious that serotonin is involved in aggression in, in mammals, mm -hmm. and that you also see that. So think of conversion evolution using the same neurotransmitter and the same yeah. receptors is quite something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the message of that evolutionary conservation you know, part that well, that's what we see in some cases. Yes. Uh, genes that you were tracking in terms of the behavioral responses of aggression versus, maybe I missed this. Which kind of genes? Nuclear what? Nuclear hormone receptors. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Some, some were identified that way, yes. You, so you, exactly. I was wondering if, uh, what's your thought on sort of the network of their ligands and how they're responding. Um, you know, obviously a fly and a bee are going to have really different, you would think, I would think, naively, a different uh, set of um, chemicals or whatever they're responding to to activate those receptors. I just wondered what your thoughts mm -hmm. were on that. Yeah, so I think, you know, you, one can imagine, uh, did everyone hear that question over on this side about nuclear oh. hormone receptors? So. The observation that there are nuclear hormone receptors involved in mediating uh, the response to social challenge, and yet knowing the great diversity of those and wondering how that works, if I paraphrased it okay. 
And so um, the initial pairing or connecting of stimuli is one thing, but then the, the machinery the, about what it activates is another thing. So that is certain parts can activate a network, but then the guts of the network could be the same. We haven't shown that experimentally, but that's the, that's the idea. Last question. Last question, Dale. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. We, when we started, we didn't know what to expect, so we, you know, in time-honored fashion, just chose the extremes. Chose, you know, really active foragers, really active nurses, and the idea was, well, if we couldn't see anything there, it's time to go home and do something else. Um, but, you know, seeing that and seeing these other things, and now with the better data acquisition methods, I think it's entirely right that one could have a, a much finer-grained analysis.